everyone. So today's video is going to be a little bit different and it might include just a tiny bit of a rant, but it's a video I've talked about doing a few times and I do think is important. So basically, I think back in late January, early February, I saw on Instagram stories a lot of people sharing a news article that was about a case study. And there were a few different sites that covered it, but the one that I saw shared the most was titled Carbon Footprint of Homegrown Food Five Times Greater Than Those Grown Conventionally. And of course, you know, in the world of gardeners, we're like, what are you talking about? That's not possible. Like, this is some huge conspiracy. So I read into the article and then I saw that it was about a specific research paper done by horticulture students, I think from the University of Michigan. And I was lucky enough because the actual research paper you had to pay for, um, I think because it was still just published back in January, I was able to get access to it from my University of Illinois ID because I am three quarters of the way almost done with my horticulture certification. So I was able to access the actual article and read it. And the actual research paper is different than the headline, which again, shouldn't be surprising, but it is. So I wanted to do a video kind of talking about this in case it is something that you saw in the media somewhere. But then as luck would have it, part of the horticulture class that I'm in right now, which is urban agriculture, was to find some research paper of your own choosing and make a presentation on it. So I was like, well, I already have the one I wanna do, so I made a PowerPoint. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is kind of talk through the article with you. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint that I made for my class and go through what the case study actually said because I do think it brought up a lot of good points as far as why urban gardening in certain cases might not be quite as eco-friendly. Um, but the message from it was not that conventional gardening and agriculture should be the way to go and nobody should have a farm in urban areas. So let me talk about the original one that I saw. Again, carbon from print of homegrown food five times greater than those grown conventionally. So first off, in no way was this research paper looking at all homegrown food. It was very specifically looking at three different types of urban agriculture sites. So the fact that they titled it as all homegrown food, and this is where my mini rant comes in because I don't really know who is to blame, but I get very irritated by headlines that don't adequately represent what's in the actual article, which happens very, very often, especially with social media. And then sometimes kind of like this, you know, this article did talk about some of the findings from the research paper, but it was still not very adequately described. But again, I don't know who's at fault because the media has to write articles that are going to get clicks because that's how they get ad revenue. So my day job is writing ads on social media like Google and Facebook. So I know all about, you know, the purpose of writing ad copy is to get people to click and come to your site. Media sites need to get traffic to make money from ads on their page. And if they don't get that traffic, they'll probably go out of business. So I understand why they do it. I wish they didn't. So then I don't know if it's like us as the readers or consumers to blame because if I had just seen, so for example, the paper itself is called Comparing Carbon Footprints of Urban and Conventional Agriculture. If that had been the title of an article, I don't think it would have been shared around social media like the one that specifically was saying that all homegrown food has a higher carbon footprint. Um, there was another one that said like urban farming has a shockingly high climate cost. It's not shocking. So we wouldn't have shared that and clicked and read about it and gotten angry about these articles. And I don't even know if most people read the articles, these headlines that weren't accurately representing what was actually the content of the paper. So I do think, I don't see media changing anytime soon. So I do think the responsibility is on us to read and get back to the original source. So what I always do, because I was shocked at how many times things that were not correct were shared. And if you just read like the first paragraph in the article, you could see. Um, so I always read the article. Like if someone shares a screenshot on social media, I'm not just going to believe what it says. Then going into the article, if that's not the original source, I try to find the original source. And if I can't, I don't form an opinion on it 
because if I'm not getting back to the original source, I don't actually know what the information says. Same thing with like videos that are edited and spliced together. If I can't see the original video in the unedited form, I don't form an opinion because I think that is definitely one of the problems today is being able to share misinformation so easily. And again, I think it's up to us. And if we didn't click on it, the media sites wouldn't do it. So anyway, mini rant over, uh, let me open up my PowerPoint presentation and I'll go through this with you. And I'm pretty sure that I can screen capture my PowerPoint presentation on here and then splice like my face and the presentation together. So like I said, the title of the research paper was Comparing the Carbon Footprints of Urban and Conventional Agriculture. Straight to the point, nothing there, that's clickbait. So what the authors said is that, you know, urban gardening specifically is growing in popularity. There's definitely more interest in it. Again, um, what we've been reading in the class is that it's kind of gone in waves and we're definitely on an uptick in terms of popularity. And there's been a lot of things showing the benefits or a lot of studies showing the benefits of like nutritional benefits, social benefits, but there hasn't been a lot of research around the environmental benefits. So specifically what they said as far as the reason for them doing this study was that despite strong evidence of social and nutritional benefits from urban agriculture, environmental claims are not well supported particularly how the environmental footprint of UA compares to the conventional agriculture that it could supplant. So that was the whole point of them doing this study. So they looked at three types of urban agriculture and specifically what they are calling low tech urban agriculture. So this doesn't include like rooftop generated gardens, greenhouses, anything like that. It's just kind of the basic, you're growing in soil in open air. Two reasons for that is one, the open air growing in soil is the most common type of gardening in urban locations. And second, most of the existing research is on those more high tech agriculture situations. So again, the greenhouses and not a lot of research has been done on the low tech. So the three different types of low tech was urban farms, which they defined as something that was professionally managed and the focus was on food production, individual gardens, which are small plots that were managed by single gardeners, and then collective gardens, which were communal spaces managed by groups of gardeners. So those were the only three types that they looked at, and again, in urban areas. So what they did was they conducted a carbon footprint analysis, and they looked at 73 different urban agricultural sites. They were in France, Germany, Poland, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Now they did use citizen science, which other than I think doing initial tours of each of the gardens, most of the data was then collected through people working at the gardens. And one of the great things about research papers is that they usually include a section on, you know, things that might have hindered their data, things that they would recommend doing differently next time. And they did say that obviously employing citizen science, you do have to rely on the individuals there. There's a lot of turnover that can cause issues. So that was something that they did specifically mention and how they kind of calculated the greenhouse gas emissions was per serving of food. So whatever fruit or vegetable they were looking at, the recommended daily serving and then divided the greenhouse gas emissions by the serving of that food. And the results from their survey, again, looking at 73 sites, in those three different categories were that the low tech urban agriculture has a carbon footprint six times that of conventional agriculture. So that's where a lot of the media articles were honing in on saying either specifically six times or the one that said shockingly high environmental cost. Uh, but that is what they found compared to the kind of conventional agriculture that was also serving food to those areas they were analyzing. So this chart here shows the carbon footprint of all urban agriculture compared to conventional and then also splits it out by the three different types that they looked at. So on average, all forms of the urban agriculture they studied are more carbon intensive than conventional agriculture. Conventional agriculture produces 0.07 kilograms carbon dioxide equivalents per serving, again, per serving of whatever it was that they were looking at. Urban agriculture on average 
produces 0 0.42 kilograms carbon dioxide equivalents per serving. So that's where that six times comes in, 0 0.07 compared to 0 0.42. And most urban farms are carbon competitive with conventional farms. So if you look here on this chart at the urban farms and where the median is compared to conventional, you can see how close together they actually are. And there actually was not a statistical significant difference between urban farms and conventional farms. So that is like one of the main things I think from the article is that those urban farms which are more professionally ran, much more similarly to conventional farms and let's say an individual garden or a community garden, very, very similar in terms of carbon competitiveness. Um, the individual gardens were just slightly more, the individual gardens had a slightly higher carbon footprint and then the highest was the community gardens. But I also wanna point out here, the numbers that they're looking at. So again, there were 73 total um, nine were collective gardens, seven were urban farms, and then 55 were the individual urban gardens. And I believe it was 17 of the 73 gardens that they looked at actually came in below the average for conventional agriculture. So in no way were the results saying it's not possible for any forms of urban agriculture to be more competitive. In fact, I think it's pretty clear here that there can be gardens that are more or less than conventional agriculture and then they get more just a little bit into why that is but just looking at this data i mean you could stop at the all urban agriculture is six times higher carbon footprint compared to conventional but then you don't really get into the nuance of all of the data that they gathered i did also want to point this out because this is something that's come up in a few other studies that we've read is that there are certain crops that are more carbon competitive. And typically those are crops that either have to travel a long distance fairly quickly, or they require a greenhouse to grow. And one of those being tomatoes. So tomatoes are typically grown in greenhouses, especially in conventional agriculture too, in order to supply tomatoes throughout the year. So those were actually more carbon competitive in the urban agriculture situations compared to conventional agriculture. So there are some crops, again, that may be more beneficial to grow in the urban environments despite anything else. Okay, so now let's talk about the carbon footprint contributors. So there were three different categories they broke this out into. One was infrastructure, which is the orange in this chart. Second was supplies, and then third was irrigation. And you can see here that infrastructure is the main contributor to carbon footprint for the urban agriculture plots that they looked at. However, this was a lot lower for the urban farms than it was for the collective gardens or the individual gardens. So infrastructure was anything from like raised beds, pathways, sheds, and basically, and what I think was kind of the main takeaway from this paper is that because a lot of community gardens especially, and even individual gardens, are viewed as just temporary uses of the land, or it's something that maybe the community garden exists and then it's ignored for a long time and then things rot and have to be rebuilt, but because the infrastructure doesn't have as long of a life cycle at these urban gardens, the constant like rebuilding and redoing of the infrastructure was the top contributor to the carbon footprint. So the main way to reduce the carbon footprint would be to put in place more long-term infrastructure that can be repaired or maybe it's higher quality so that it's not being constantly replaced. And that has definitely impacted me in my garden here. Like I wanna make sure I'm getting containers that I can continue to use for years and years. You know, my, even my garden furniture, I wanna get things that I'm gonna to continue to use and not be replacing like all of my pots every few years. They were talking about how, you know, a raised bed that's only gonna last for five years versus some of the conventional agriculture where they have facilities that are decades. That's the difference. They're not being replaced. The infrastructure at the conventional agriculture sites is not being replaced with the same frequency as the urban farms, urban gardens. And I think that's also why 
looking at this chart, infrastructure wasn't as big of an issue for most of the urban farms. Again, because when it's something that's an urban farm, typically it means that the land is probably a bit more protected by the city and that land use is going to be there long term for the urban farm versus a community garden where somebody can buy the plot and then put in a building. So you're losing that land. So that was definitely the main contributor. And then supplies and irrigation, they talked a little bit about that, but that doesn't seem to have the big impact that infrastructure does. So there are three recommendations on how to make urban agriculture more carbon competitive was one, to extend the infrastructure lifetimes. And they talked about how that has to involve governmental policies to protect that land. Um, two was to use urban waste as inputs. The more that we can reuse, for example, I think they were talking about materials at construction sites that maybe can't be reused for um, construction of buildings, but can be repurposed for community gardens or individual gardens. Um, and then also was to generate high levels of social benefits. So something that conventional agriculture doesn't really provide are the social benefits. You know, it's not really a community gathering space. So by focusing more on that with the urban agriculture, those benefits can kind of offset a potentially higher carbon footprint. This slide was just my takeaways and implications. And then I also did share here all of the headlines because I was annoyed by them um, and I wanted to put them into our presentation. So that's what the research paper said. Again, I don't think it was really anything shocking. Um, pretty straightforward. Here's what we found. Here's the issues, some limitations of our study. Here's ways to improve in the future. The point of this was definitely not that urban farming shouldn't happen. It's that there are some areas of improvement in urban farming, urban gardening, especially by the city typically treating it as a temporary land use versus something that's going to be there long term. I mean, I don't think I would consider my garden very environmentally friendly if like every five years I threw away all of my pots and ordered a bunch of new pots that just wouldn't make sense and I think that's what the article was trying to show that we need better infrastructure for urban agriculture um, long-term security of that land in order to reduce the carbon footprint I think it also said in here that if everything that was used was recycled then the carbon footprint would beat that of conventional agriculture so it's in no way saying it's not possible it's just saying hey Here's some ways to improve. Um, so yeah, that's that article. Definitely not as controversial as the media coverage made it seem. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know and I will see you in the next video. Bye.